site with this river flowing and the grass is growing on the hills. And he says, wow, my profits are going to go through the roof if I take my sheep, my cattle down into this valley. They're going to have plenty to eat. They're going to have plenty to drink. They're going to be fat. They're going to sell a lot on the market. He saw his profit shares going through the roof. And so he said, I'll take the valley. Abraham was generous in accepting less in order to keep the peace. To Abraham, family peace was more important than personal profit. Has God called you to be generous with another member of your family? We're sometimes involved with matters of finance or personal property with family members. Sometimes God is calling us to be generous in those dealings. Or maybe... Maybe those dealings have taken place already, and we feel like we've been taken advantage of. Is God calling us to forgive someone who has taken advantage of us in the past? Abraham, Abraham modeled generosity, even by getting as he was getting less than he deserved. He demonstrated his faith, in that what his faith was not in God, and his, his faith was in God and not in possessions. He didn't have faith in what he could get, but what God could provide. Not only had Lot chosen the land that seemed most likely to make him richer at Abraham's expense, but the text ominously hints at the future that greed and selfishness will bring. Listen as I read to you Genesis 13, verses 10 and following. Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zor. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan. And Lot pitched his tents near a place called Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of Sodom were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Not only were Lot's motivations selfish, but they were also immoral. He knew the reputation of Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody in that area did. But for profit, he chose to reside in close company with the people whose reputation for immorality live in infamy. Notice that the text says that Lot pitched his tent near Sodom and then points out how wicked and how the people of Sodom constantly sinned against the Lord. For prophet Lot was willing to risk the sinful influences of the most notoriously wicked people in the face of the planet in all of human history. What a fool. Can I say idiot from the pulpit? Will I get in trouble? Will parents write me notes and say, our children aren't supposed to say that? Mary's nodding yes. Your children should be old enough to know better. <laughs> what's more important, getting rich or doing what's right? Making a profit or cultivating character? In Lot's mind, it was the money. He would have to learn a hard, hard lesson, as does everyone who values money over godliness. Genesis 14 tells the story of how the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were defeated by an alliance, an alliance of other kings, regional kings, tribal leaders. These inv this invading alliance took plunder from the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they carried off and captured all the people that were living in the city. Where were they living? In the city. Where was Lot living? So far we know that he was living near the city. But it says that they captured and carried off Lot as well as he was now living in the city. Notice how he moved. He moved from near the wicked city to in the wicked city. He moved from near the sinful people to residing with the sinful people. He was getting more and more comfortable with the ways of these people that God would very soon 
destroy off the face of the earth. Because of Lot's selfishness and cavalier attitude toward the immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah, he now finds himself in a real bind. Literally, he is bound and taken captive by an invading alliance. He has been a fool, and now he's paying for it. How does Abraham respond? Abraham, here's the news that Lot has been carried off. How does he respond? Serves him right. My nephew, what a fool. He's been so selfish and greedy. He took the more valuable land. It serves him right. He deserves to be carried off. He gets involved with the pyramid scheme. Serves him right. He is an idiot. He deserves what he's getting. I wash my hands of him. Is that how Abraham responds? No. Abraham immediately musters his men, gets weapons for them, and pursues the captives. When he overtakes them, he retrieves and rescues not only Lot, but all of the possessions of the city. Don't rush too quickly by this. Abram has taken great risks upon himself to rescue Lot. You see, if he fails, the invading alliance will go back and take his things too. I mean, why not? They just defeated the army. They might as well have the plunder too. Abraham risks his, risks his life, the lives of his people, the lives of his people, and his possessions to rescue a fool, to enter into battle, to save Lot from his own blundering ways. This, in fact, is a picture of God's love for us. You've made some silly mistakes. If you're like me, you've made some silly mistakes in your life. We've chosen sometimes selfishly, or perhaps arrogantly, or morally, and we've failed God at different points. And yet, Jesus comes after us to save us. He lays his own life on the line to save a bunch of fools like us. He loves us. Like Abraham loved Lot. He shows his generosity like Abraham did for Lot. We live in a time when people are losing everything. Some people have made foolish decisions and they have lost everything. Others have done nothing foolish at all and still have lost great amounts or even been left without a job or homeless. If God has preserved you and me during this time of economic hardship, is it so that we can live the good life and celebrate our fortune? God has not called us to live lives of comfort while others suffer. If we have obeyed God's command and His guidance in the financial areas, and God has provided for us because of our obedience, then He has done so, not so that we can laugh and point the finger at those around us who have fallen prey to our economy, but so that we can be in a better position to help those around us. God has preserved us so that we can be in a position to serve others. To help others. To be generous to those in need. And yes, even to fools. That's what God has done for us. That's what Abraham did for Lot. And that's what he calls us to do for our brothers and sisters around us. Our conflict, internally for me at least, is too often has this person done something foolish to get themselves into this mess? Or sometimes we want proof that they're going to be able to get out of it before we're willing to help people. They've got to meet certain criteria that we set up before we're willing to help. But Jesus gave himself on the cross for us while we were still sinners. Trapped in our own foolishness. And God calls us to love people in all circumstances, in his name. The fourth way that Abraham was generous is that he tithed. When Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and the priest of God came out to bless Abraham on his return journey, he has just rescued Lot, he has just retrieved all the possessions from Sodom and Gomorrah and the other towns in the area, he meets Melchizedek, the priest of God, Abraham willingly gives one-tenth, a tithe, of everything he had, 
to God.